Cable Bahamas has always been considered the innovator. People can have confidence in Cable Bahamas as a mobile operator because of our past history. We've proven to the Bahamian community that we are in fact able to manage additional services as a telecommunications company. Customers expect the best from Cable Bahamas. The technology that we bring is revolutionary technology because we know that the Bahamian public, they deserve it and Cable Bahamas is here to bring it to them. We are ready. Turn us on. BC Chairman Leslie Miller warns of further power outages to accommodate the world relays. Public Accounts Committee Chairman Hubert Chipman's vow to table that controversial urban renewal audit. An infamous inmate found dead inside his prison cell, plus Ronnie Butler to be honored as part of the Junkanoo Carnival festivities. We've got those stories and more coming up tonight. I'm Dana Smith and NB12 starts right now. Tonight, the remainder of the week may not be as pleasant as some anticipate, according to BC Executive Chairman Leslie Miller, who said it will take several days for the corporation to somewhat bounce back from major problems it's now experiencing. Miller today also indicated that those with no plans of attending the World Relays will more than likely have to go without power occasionally, so there is no power loss at the meet. Kyle Joaquin reports. We are not going to be able to supply all of the electricity that is needed in New Providence for the next week or so. And that's the sad position BEC Executive Chairman Leslie Miller says the company is in as it seeks to address failed engines and a slew of other issues. According to Miller, BEC's Blue Hills power plant is operating at about 103 megawatts, but that 103 is much less than the demand of 220. Miller said the company El Greco has sent five generators which are now in the country and over the next few weeks. He said more are to come as they prepare for the summer months. However, one of Blue Hill's main engines, he said, is awaiting the replacement of a rotor, which won't arrive until the next 60 days. But could residents of New Providence with no plans of attending the IAAF World Relays be in for two dark nights this weekend? According to Miller, many may be forced to sacrifice their electricity for the sake of the country's reputation as the world's biggest track stars duke it out on the rubber. What we will do um, when the time comes on Friday, Saturday and Sunday, We'll have to await energy from elsewhere. In other words, when the bread and the sweating, the people in the stadium will be able to watch the games. That's what we got to be. That's going to spread it around and try to minimize the impact to any of our customers. But certainly we cannot um, have an embarrassment of an international competition of this caliber where there's any interruption in electricity. I assure you that will not happen. Miller said he has already ensured organizers of the relays that there will be no interruptions in their service. However, that didn't go without him expressing disappointment in lights being on at the stadium last night when many areas of New Providence were without power. Every single light was on. Every light on the track, those big lights that burn a hell of a lot of electricity, was on. I'm asking them, in fact, I'm warning them, if you don't turn those lights off, we can turn it off tonight ourselves. Stop wasting electricity that you cannot afford at this crucial time. Load shedding continued for a third straight day today. The frequent and sometimes extensive outages have crippled many businesses. Miller said he has even received a letter from Atlantis questioning what BEC is going to do for the loss the hotel may have suffered. Atlantis indicating that their losses during that island-wide blackout exceeded $1.5 million and they want to know where they're going to get restitution from, i.e., is BEC prepared to pay them for their losses? I think we're going to have a lot of other companies, the major hoteliers, are now going to be doing likewise. We have some enormous problems that we have to face. Miller said he met with Deputy Prime Minister Philip Davis Tuesday morning in hopes that Cabinet would have made a decision on which company would take over management at BEC as early as Tuesday's Cabinet meeting. But again, as BEC awaits those new engines, Miller says customers here in New Providence could expect more load shedding within the coming days. Reporting for NB12, I'm Kyle Joaquin. Former Minister of State for the Environment, Fenton Nemore, is once again predicting a rough summer ahead for Bahamians 
His reason, the government and BC officials just can't get it together. He says the Bahamian people will have a bitter pill to swallow as a result of the government's incompetence when it comes to BC. Simone Davis has that angle. Last summer, Nemour warned Bahamian residents and business owners to prepare for major power outages and rising electricity costs. Today, Nemour asserted, so said, so done, adding that Bahamians will face the same issues this year. Basically, from statement of Mr. Miller, today they are facing a 15% shortfall in terms of energy capacity. That is significant. What it essentially means is that one in seven may face electrical challenges this evening. We should be very concerned about that. I'm even more concerned with the summer where the demand is around 240 megawatts. There we will be facing essentially more than a 30% shortfall if we're at the stage we're at today. BEC Chairman Leslie Miller revealed that BEC is in crisis mode and faces a worsening situation in the absence of urgent action on energy reform. Nemour said BEC can't do anything without the government and he doubts that the Christie administration knows what to do to solve these issues, but he is sure that it can't afford the equipment needed. Well, I believe the PLP does not know what to do because BEC is a very complex issue. You have to address BEC also from a legislative standpoint. We began that process. One of the first things we began to do was to have IRCA oversee the energy sector uh, because IRCA and others need to ensure that the, from a financial standpoint, everything that BEC is doing is correct for instance, rate increases, etc. And so we enacted the legislation for that. All that needed to be done now is for IRCA to begin to act. And so the government needs to ensure that the staff is put in place in IRCA to oversee BEC. He also said the decision to spend $8 million to provide additional 40 megawatts of power for the next nine months is a Band-Aid approach and greater focus should be placed on long-term solutions. We need to put in place at BEC a clear plan that will help them operationally and financially. When we were the government, we recognized that one of those who were delinquent in paying BEC was the government itself. And we immediately gave them $18 million to bring the government in a better financial position with BEC and allowing them to have the cash flow that was necessary to purchase these equipment. Where is the government today? Is government paying its light bill? Uh, are members of the government paying their light bill. As many businesses and residents are affected by these power outages, Nemour says it could have an economic impact. What is even of greater concern is that BEC is so far in the hole today that they themselves are now dragging down the economy of the Bahamas. Many businesses have had to suffer over many years as a result and it is getting worse. In order for BEC to recover from their current position, it would require significant assistance from the government or the Bahamian public. In both cases, the Bahamian public will pay the price. The former Minister of State for the Environment said the Bahamas is even further behind than where the country ought to be, and it is time to move beyond the political approach in order to strengthen the economy. Reporting for NB12, I'm Simone Davis. Jamal Agee Gibson, who was recently charged with murder and attempted murder, was found dead inside his prison cell at the Department of Corrections, according to Commissioner of Correctional Services Patrick Wright. In a statement, Wright said Gibson was found unresponsive inside his cell at 5.45 a.m. The statement read, the institution's medical officer was contacted and on arrival conducted an examination. At the conclusion of the examination, the inmate was pronounced dead. The cause of death is unknown. Wright said Her Majesty's coroner and police were contacted following the discovery and the matter is under investigation. He added all other inmates remain in safe custody. The statement did not say whether Gibson was alone in his cell. Back in January, Gibson was one of the most wanted men in the Bahamas. 
He appeared in court on January 9th before Magistrate Joanne Ferguson Pratt, charged with one count of murder, three counts of attempted murder, and five counts of assault with a deadly weapon. He had spent months evading police but was eventually arrested at a Broadfield Road home in eastern New Providence. He was charged with the September 29, 2014 murder of Ricardo Moss and the attempted murder of three other men, including Carlos Lamb. He was also accused of assaulting two police officers and two civilians. In other news, 14 women, 12 of whom are Jamaican, appeared in the magistrate's court today charged with committing a grossly indecent act. Eight of them were further charged with working as dancers without work permits at a local nightclub. The owner of that club also appeared in court today, charged, among other things, with abetting the women. 40-year-old Omar Gordon of Sears Road was charged with keeping his Madeira Street nightclub, called Club Pure, open beyond the licensed hours. He was also charged for failing to display his license in a conspicuous place and for playing loud music and also for refusing to allow police officers on the premises. Gordon was further charged with 14 counts of abetting 14 different women in committing a grossly indecent act. Bahamian's 19-year-old Rakia Rose and 34-year-old Amir Kali, along with Jamaican's 28-year-old Roxanne Brooks, 19-year-old Kia Gale, 30-year-old Simone Henry, 32-year-old Elsie Davis, 34-year-old Kilo Alvarenga, 32-year-old Carrie Ann Kelly, 26-year-old Crystal Jones, 24-year-old Dana Bryan, 27-year-old Nikisha Evans, 24-year-old Shamelia Daly, 33 Three-year-old Marcia Henry and 39-year-old Karen Darling were all charged with one count of committing a grossly indecent act. Daly, Alvaranga, Gale, Brooks, Kelly, Davis, Jones, and Bryan were further charged for working as dancers at Club Pure without a work permit. The offenses are all alleged to have occurred this past Saturday on April 25th. Daly was also charged with possession of a forged document, allegedly having a Bahamian immigration stamp inside a Jamaican passport, knowing the same not to be genuine. Brooks, Davis, and Bryan were further charged with overstaying. Each member of the group pleaded not guilty to the charges, and all were represented by attorney Jomo Campbell. They appeared before magistrate Andrew Forbes. Police prosecutor Ursel Dorset argued that Omar Gordon should not be granted bail because Gordon is already on bail for similar offenses. He added investigations into the matter are ongoing and he's concerned Gordon may interfere. He also told the court Gordon has residency in Jamaica and could be a flight risk. The prosecutor also argued the women should not be granted bail because they may also interfere in investigations, adding investigators are making inquiries along the lines of human trafficking. He added the Jamaican women are also potential flight risk. In response, Campbell told the court Gordon is still innocent until proven guilty and said Gordon's Jamaican residency was not an issue the first time he was granted bail, so it shouldn't be an issue this time. As for the flight risk concerns, he said the court can impose certain conditions and restrictions to ensure he remains in this jurisdiction. Campbell said there's no indication the women are a flight risk and none of them have any previous convictions or pending matters. He added the courts have, on past occasions, granted bail to non-Bahamians for more serious offenses. Ultimately, Forbes granted bail to Rose and Colley in the sum of $2,000, while Daly was granted bail for $1,500. He told Gordon he had the right to apply to the Supreme Court for bail, and as it relates to the rest of the women, Forbes said the question of bail will be addressed upon confirmation of their immigration status. The group is set to appear back in court on July 15th for trial. Amid questions over the Public Accounts Committee's probe into government's small home repairs program, PAC Chairman Hubert Shipman said today that the PAC will not be deterred. He promised to present its report on the controversial program to the House of Assembly with or without the input of the Urban Renewal co-chairs. Vonik Toot reports. Unfazed by what he described as an odd legal opinion by the Attorney General's office, PAC Chairman Hubert Chipman says the committee will not let up on its probe into the Urban Renewal Commission's small home repairs program. In fact, he said even if Cynthia Mother Pratt and Algernon Allen still refuse to appear before the committee, they will proceed. 
at the end of the day, we will report one way or the other. I will tell you that with or without the co-chairs appearing before the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, we have enough information. We have conducted uh, interviews with the various people from Urban Renewal. So it will be more complete if they decide to come and sit with us. They, we haven't accused them of anything. Nobody has accused them of anything as far as I am aware of. So it will be good to have them come and sit and chat with us. Urban Renewal co-chairs Algernon Allen and Cynthia Pratt have both refused to appear before the PAC, arguing that the process undertaken by the committee was inappropriate and illegal. The Attorney General's office subsequently determined that the course of action taken by the PAC was legally improper. Chipman said the AG's legal opinion on the matter is odd, given that she has yet to decide on other matters that require her attention. It's odd. It's odd, to be honest with you, uh, considering, you know, it just surface. It's the surface, and it was like a 24-hour period or 36-hour period, something like a legal opinion uh, that you've been waiting for numerous things for the Attorney General to make a decision on. However, legal opinion just shows up. Chipman said it is still unclear who requested the AG's input. However, he said based on the legal opinion that he has received since that opinion was made public, the PAC was within its rights to call for the co-chairs to appear at a PAC hearing. Seek legal advice, and my advice basically is they didn't see anything why, they were, why we couldn't deal with the report. So um, we'll see where it goes. House Speaker Dr. Kendall Major said on Monday he is optimistic that his team can move beyond the AG's purported legal opinion. Major, who recently said that he was shocked by the opinion, met with his clerks to discuss the matter, adding they agreed on a plan they are comfortable with. The Urban Renewal Commission's Small Home Repairs Program has been the subject of debate following the Auditor General's report, which revealed that 11 contractors were paid $171,000 for work that was either incomplete or never done. Reporting for NB12, I'm Vonnie Tude.